I'm not too sure how many of you uh, walk into the jungles to look at butterflies. Uh, this is a very rare butterfly in Sri Lanka. And uh, if you want to see this, be prepared to be bitten by mosquitoes and, uh, uh, and uh, infested with leeches. A montane species. Uh, if you go to Neuralia, you'll see this, but uh, not below about uh, 15, 1600 meters. The tawny raja, I don't think many of you have seen a picture like this, because this is a canopy species found both in the wet zone and the dry zone. And this is a very widespread species called the Jezebel. Uh, and I'm sure lots of you in Colombo have seen this as well, uh, because uh, the caterpillars feed on mistletoe, and uh, mistletoe is found everywhere. So uh, you will see this butterfly throughout the island. And for those people who have visited uh, the Doric at Aripu, or you've been to the arid zone in the northwestern region, you will probably have seen this as well. I haven't given you the names, but I will later on. The question is, that's the question that I'm trying to answer today. Where did these butterflies come from? Are they Sri Lankan butterflies? I'm going to leave this question open, and we'll get to this later on. How about this guy? Looks Sri Lankan? Sri Lankan? Any guesses? How about India? Are they from India? Nobody's able to place his bets, eh? or her bets. We'll see. How about our endemics? Are these from Sri Lanka? Yes? True, endemic means that it is only found in Sri Lanka. That's what it means. But are they really from Sri Lanka? Where did they originate? I'm casting some doubt. Even our endemics may not be from here, right? Let's have a look and see how that all happens. So my talk here is going to be, where did the butterflies come from? And if they came from somewhere else, how did they get here? And what processes did they use to get here? And what of their future? Where are we going from here? Would the butterfly survive the next century? And if so, which ones would not survive and which ones would, would survive? That's my name for people who don't know me. Now, in order to start where the butterfly started or originated from, I had to really take you back to 200 million years ago. And I'm not going to be talking about butterflies for the next 10 minutes because I, I have to give you some context as to what I'm going to talk about. So uh, just uh, sit tight. It's not going to be butterflies for the next 10 minutes or so. But uh, as I said, to, as a prelude to talking about the origins of the butterflies, I need to talk about something else. So here it is. This is what the world looked like, the planet looked like about 200 years, million years ago. Uh, one big ocean and one big blob of land. And uh, they had all sorts of names for these things. Uh, you will see that in a subsequent slide. And so what did it look like? 200 million years ago. Well, this is an artist's impression of what it could have been 200 million years ago. We hadn't arrived on the scene yet, so uh, we really don't know what it looked like. But it's a reconstruct based on uh, uh, scientific evidence, fossil records, and so on and so forth. Now, we had, uh, for the fauna, we had springtails, cockroaches, uh, locusts, dragonflies, uh, amphibians, reptiles, and of course, ancient butterflies. I don't want to call them primitive butterflies, but they were ancient butterflies. Now, this was the era uh, which we call the Triassic. You know, the geologic time scale is very different. So we have the Triassic, uh, we have then the Jurassic, which is the time of the dinosaurs, the big dinosaurs that we talk about. So this is the end of the Triassic. Uh, and we had the cusp of the arrival of the dinosaurs, the bigger ones. So what were the plants like? The plants of the mosses which you see even uh, in damp places in Sri Lanka, if you go up into the country, uh, into the hills. And there were also the ferns. Now remember, these things did not produce seeds. They had spores. They propagated by spores. This has relevance to butterflies, as you will soon see. And we had also the cycads. The cycads are a group of plants called gymnosperms. They're very ancient. And uh, you probably all have seen this. Uh, we call it madu in, uh, in, in Sinhalese, madu plant. And uh, what is really interesting about this is that these are not fruits. What you see on the right-hand side are not fruits. They are seeds. 
Technically, uh, a seed and a fruit are completely different. Although it looks big, this is actually a seed. We haven't come to the fruit stage in our evolution so far, at least at this point in time. And these are the male flowers. Now, what is really interesting about the male flower is, it, is that it produces copious amounts of pollen, huge amounts. Uh, this is one of the characteristics of the ancient plants. And uh, this is also true of the conifers, the spruces, and the pines. These are temperate species for the most part now, very few in the tropics. And uh, just want to tell you that this is a cone. This is not a fruit. There were no fruits at the time. And the seeds are in here. This is actually a leaf, and this is a leaf. These are modified leaves. So you have two leaves and a seed inside. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, what we have is a spruce tree uh, that has been uh, just blown by a, a whiff of wind. And you can see what happens to the pollen. There's enormous amounts of pollen produced by these plants. Of course, uh, they were very efficient at pollination. I, I take it that everybody here understands pollination, the movement of pollen from the male to the female components. And uh, uh, it was very efficient in the sense that so much pollen was produced that it almost made sure that all the female flowers were fertilized. But it's, a, it's not an efficient system. It's very effective, but not efficient, because there's an enormous amount of wastage, and pollen is expensive because it's based on proteins. It's a protein-based compound inside, so it's a very expensive. But nevertheless, they produce copious amounts of pollen. Now, let me get back to the butterflies. Were there butterflies at the time? Yes, indeed. But these are very, very different to the butterflies of our times. And the fundamental difference was that they did not have a long proboscis, as you know the current day butterflies have. They had what they call uh, biting mouth parts or grinding mouth parts. This, in fact, is a very, very primitive moth. Incidentally, we don't uh, make a distinction between moths and butterflies in the scientific world. Uh, they are in the same group of uh, insects. Right? So this is a very primitive moth or very ancient moth, and it doesn't have a long proboscis or a tongue. And uh, the way it feeds uh, is it has, it has uh, I'll show you that. Uh, I think I have a slide here. Now, it looks like a complicated diagram, but it is really not. Over here, these two flaps open up, and there's a, there's a structure like a pestle and mortar. You know, and it takes the pollen in, and it grinds it, and it eats it. So these, uh, these moths are still prevalent even today. So that's the way the ancient uh, butterflies looked like. So there was no nectar, no flowers, no fruits, nothing of the sort. All right, so that's what the world looked like at the time in terms of the flora and the fauna 200, 280 million years ago. Now I'm going to take you back as to what happens to this land mass. Thank you. Can you open this for me, please? I'll just open it, thanks. Um, the land mass was called Pangaea. It, when it was one block, big mass. So with the passage of time, what happened was it started fragmenting. It started breaking up into smaller pieces. So it, it breaks apart, and it forms two major land masses. One is called Laurasia, and the other one, Gondwana. So there are two land masses that are now separating with the passage of time. And this is what it looks like uh, 200 million years ago, the Triassic. As I said, that's the geologic time scale that we're using. The scientists use this term. And then 145 million years ago, you can see the rudiments of South America, Africa, North America, Australia, uh, and the Antarctica forming. And that's 65 million years ago, the late Cretaceous. And then this is the present day world that we see in our planet. Now, now the thing is, how do we know this? In, in fact, uh, in this presentation, I really like to, uh, like to uh, walk you through how scientists think and how they solve problems rather than just uh, giving you facts. And uh, so this, this whole idea that uh, this, the land mass was one continent was first proposed by a chap of a Abraham Otelius in the 1500s, 1590s. What he said was, you know what? When I look at this map, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. I can take this and fix it over here. It fits in nicely. I can take this, fix it there. It fixes nicely. I can bring it here. I can bring this piece here. And he said, you know, these things are all once upon a time together. Of course, the problem with him was that he couldn't explain how this happened. 
until I got, I all prov provide evidence to uh, substantiate uh, his theory that they were together. Until, of course, a person by the name of Agri uh, Alfred Wegener comes along, he's a geologist by training, and in 1912, he comes up with the evidence that says this actually happened. So I'm going to show you some of that evidence. So there's the evidence. Uh, if you look at the, now this, this is when the continents were together. And if you look here, there are fossil records of a certain animal, of certain ancient reptiles, here and here were identical. So he said, well, if they are identical, they must have been together at some point in time. But then, of course, there were others who said, well, you know what happened? This guy here swam across the sea. That's how he got over there. But the, the, the argument didn't hold water because structurally, these were animals that could not swim. And of course, subsequently, they found many, many other records of fossils, uh, which are very, very similar in uh, Antarctica, India, and here, the same fossils. So they knew that the only way that this could have happened was if the continents were together. Um, then also the geologic structure. Remember, Wagner was a geologist by training. And he found that uh, the mountain ranges, for instance, in North America, the Appalachian Range, <coughs> was identical to the range in the, the uh, Caledonians in North Europe. So they must have been together. Uh, the underlying rock was the same, igneous rocks of various types, which matched the ones on the other side of the continent. So he said, well, these are matching, these are matching. And also, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there's also evidence from paleomagnetism. Uh, it, just to explain that, I know it sounds a bit of a high sounding word, but <laughs> what, what happens is this. Uh, when a volcano or when uh, volcanic eruptions occur, there's the magma that comes up, right? Everybody knows that? Now, the magma contains particles of iron. And when these things crystallize, they align according to the magnetic axis of the Earth. So, if the volcan volcanic eruptions occur, they, uh, the lava comes out, it cools, and then, of course, the uh, crystals of iron align themselves to the magnetic field and they become solidified. And by studying the rocks, you can actually tell the direction in which they are facing, the north and the south. But what happened was, this is what we would expect. It should be straight, be the magnetic north-south. The rock should have the same magnetism north and south. But they found that it was slightly skewed, either to the right, 40 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on and so forth. So this was strong evidence that as, uh, the, with the passage of time, as the rocks moved, remember the drift of the continents? As they moved, they also rotated. Uh, in uh, various shapes and forms, and then uh, got displaced. So the magnetism is not exactly north-south. Now, the only problem that Wegener had was he couldn't explain how this happens. How does this happen? Well, we know now the mechanism underlying this process. It's called uh, plate tectonics. Yeah, I'm sure you have heard of this uh, word somewhere. Essentially, what happens is this. Uh, here's a planet. The innermost core is absolutely solid, nickel and iron at five, 6,000 degrees centigrade. Outside is a liquid layer, and still outermost is a layer uh, which we call the magma, which is the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. It's very plasticky. On top of that sits the soil and the rocks. So it's like a bunch of plates on the planet moving around uh, on a semi-solid liquid. And how does this happen? Well, because the interior, because the interior of the earth is so hot, it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a pot of boiling water. You know, stuff from the center comes up, and it causes convection currents. So as it comes up, the pressure builds up, and in various places, it spews out into the uh, earth's uh, crust. And what happens is that it starts spreading the two continents apart. So here's the magma coming up pushes the continents apart, and the continents start drifting. So that's how the continents came into being. Now, you might be wondering, what's this all got to do with butterflies, right? So I'm going to tell you about why uh, this is so important, uh, the, the, the prelude to uh, talking about butterflies, why this is so important. So I'm going to take you back to what the world looked like uh, two, 200 million years ago. So here's my butterfly. I said there were ancient butterflies. This is not an ancient butterfly. These are more for butterflies from South America. 
but the ancient butterflies were ra flying around. They were there. Now the fragmentation starts taking place. It starts breaking up. Now let's focus on Sri Lanka, India, Madagascar, and Africa, because they're all together. These are the pieces that are going to separate. India is here, Madagascar, this is Africa over here. But remember, it's one land mass. There is no borders at all. It's just one land mass. Now, what happens is that as they start isolating, as they, as they start fragmenting and moving apart, the butterflies, these are very important concepts, uh, especially for the Trinitians who are, who are with me in school, who never listen to their teachers very well. So, uh, so I hope that uh, they'll be listening carefully. What happens is this. The, the species separate out. The, the butterflies separate out. And uh, one population now cannot mate with the other population because the oceanic gap is too wide. So now they start drifting away, these butterflies. Let's assume that the butterflies here are now drifting away. Now, as it drifts, there are several things that happen. The climate changes. They might be moving to very arid zones. They might be uh, moving into a temperate zone. They might be uh, tropical forests. And things are changing. Remember, evolution is taking place. The plants are changing. So, so are the butterflies. So the butterflies are going to meet different environments as they move apart. Now, as they move apart over many, many thousands of years, they have to adapt to the environment in which they find themselves. So let's say that this particular group of butterflies are faced with very dry conditions, right? Now, unless they adapt very quickly, they're going to get wiped out. So how do they adapt themselves? They adapt themselves by undergoing genetic changes. So you need genetic changes. The genes have to change somehow. One, two, or three, or four genes have to change. And uh, they have to be beneficial. These mutations, we call them mutations. These mutations have to be very beneficial in order for the butterflies to survive in the dry environment. So let's assume that there is a genetic change that allows these butterflies to survive in the dry environment. So what happens? That population will now reproduce and pass on the genes to the next generation. And they are going to be very successful. right? Their cousins might fail because they couldn't uh, adapt to the dry environment and they may have fizzled out. But these butterflies will survive. So with the passage of time, perhaps maybe 50,000, 100,000 years later, there might be another mutation. A mutation is a genetic change. I kind of put a DNA strand here. These are DNA molecules, uh, which are uh, long strands. And they compose what they call the genes. And um, so another genetic change might take place. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say the color of the butterfly. It becomes lighter. Do you think that a lighter butterfly will survive in a dry environment better than a colored one? I don't want people falling asleep. That's why I'm asking questions. OK, yes. The reason is that in dry environments, everything is much lighter. So a lighter colored butterfly would perhaps survive much better, especially uh, you know, the, 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 the impact of predators might be much lower. So that might be very advantageous. That mutation might be very beneficial, and that gene will get uh, propagated in that population. Now that's a second mutation, and a third, and a fourth. And very soon, what happens is that we have a new butterfly, which is very, very distinct from the butterflies from which it arose. So the ancestors are now very different from the current day butterflies. <coughs> now, that population that we have in the dry zone may not mate with the original population from where it came. And when that, when that happens, uh, it is now a new species. So a species is a group of individuals that mate among themselves and reproduce offspring that are fertile, uh, but they can't mate with anybody else. So now you have a new species. So this is how speciation occurs, not only in butterflies, but this is true for all forms of uh, village flora fauna. Isolation and uh, genetic changes bring about mutations, and they will lead to uh, new species being formed. So as the continents drift, as the continents drift, uh, we have South America, Africa, and all these things, all these uh, countries, they are drifting apart, and their speciation and newer species are being formed, well adapted to the environment in which they are found, when they find themselves. Now, remember, mutations are not always beneficial. In fact, most mutations are uh, deleterious, 
and they might actually kill that population or kill those individuals. And some are neutral. Uh, if there's a genetic change, uh, it just gets carried away in the population, uh, which they call genetic drift. So, um, so that's, that's what isolation does to butterflies. With the passage of time, they will change as they go into new environments. Everybody OK so far? I haven't lost anybody. Good. This is a population of individuals. So is this, 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 and this. So these are different species. And we call them, when they are closely related, and they're very, very similar, we call them as belonging to a specific genus. OK? Two words that I'll be using continuously in this lecture, genus and species. So a genus is basically a group of individuals that are very, very similar uh, and have uh, some sort of common origin, very close common origin. Everybody OK with those two terms, genus and species? All right. So uh, one more point that I want to make, uh, one more point that I want to make is that uh, uh, the genitalia, if you look at, uh, for butterflies, it's very important to look at the genitalia, the genital structures, because uh, almost all the species that are related to each other and are closely related will have very similar ones, but still they'll be different. So that's one of the criteria that we use to distinguish species as well. Of course, we can use DNA analysis and things like that today as well. But uh, the genitalia are very important for identifying species. So uh, the, the thing about this is, now, how do we know that they are really closely related? By the looks? Well, that's one thing. You can look at the internal structure like the genitalia, yes. But what further evidence do we have? Well, they lay eggs on the same type of plant. All these butterflies lay eggs on violets, whether it be in Africa, Ireland. This is from Ireland, and this is from Kerala, Nepal, Sri Lanka, China. They all lay eggs on violets. The larvae feed only on violets. The caterpillars look similar. The pupae look similar. Uh, and their behaviors are similar, the way that they fly, and so on and so forth. So that's how they know that they had a common origin. And uh, so the, the, the uh, scientists classify this as uh, belonging to a specific genus. Uh, and under that, you have all these species. Here's another one. Uh, I thought I'll put some Sri Lankan butterflies as well. Uh, this genus is called Spindaces. Uh, we have seven species. And this one is adapted into the very, very dry regions. You will not see it anywhere below. Uh, about Irna Madu or somewhere there. It's a, it's a northern species in very dry climates. And this one, on the other hand, you will see only at Horton Plains and the uh, Great Western Mountain Range. So it's adapted to the highest elevations in Sri Lanka and can weather the very, very cold weather quite nicely. But if you look at their gentle structures, the general appearance, the flight pattern, the speed at which they fly, uh, they're pretty much all the same, right? So. They belong to the same genus, but different species. Now, so here are our butterflies moving along. They are speciating. All kinds of things are being formed. The plants are also speciating. Now, about 130 to 140 million years ago, another major event takes place. The arrival of the angiosperms. Now, the angiosperms are the plants that you see when you look through your window. Uh, Ahala trees. Uh, just name about anything that you see is an uh, angiosperm. They have flowers, they have fruits, which the previous plants didn't have. So what's so special about this in terms of the radiation of the butterflies? Well, the plants developed a very ingenious mechanism. Now remember, I told you that the earlier plants depended on wind for pollination. But these plants devised an extremely ingenious method of getting themselves pollinated, and not only that spreading throughout the globe and occupying virtually all the niches and evolving thousands and thousands of different species. And how do they do that? Well, they, they came up with a really, really good solution. And that is what we call nectar. They produce nectar for the first time in flowers, in floral structures. And of course, this was like liquid go for all butterflies because <laughs> they, they, they had to, now in the good old days, they had to go after pollen and munch it digest it and wait for a long time for it to get digested because proteins are much more difficult to digest than uh, uh, this stuff that they are producing now, uh, sugars. And they were in liquid form, they were easily digestible, and they could easily be obtained. So butterflies quickly adopted this new source as, uh, the, the, energy, uh, as the energy source uh, for uh, getting about, flying about, 
meeting uh, boys and girls and having sex and <laughs> laying the eggs and all sorts of things. All right? So the butterflies really, really moved on to these plants, and so did the other insects. 